old school mix plus TV video. In this one, 12 biggest EQ mistakes that you are making, or maybe not, but just watch the video anyway. <laughs> Let's go to it. Hello everyone, welcome back to Mix Best TV. Hope you're having a great day. Before we start, please check the info box down below for my mixing courses on ProMix Academy, free plugin, special discounts and offers. And if you really wanna learn how to mix and master professionally, click the join button down here, become a Mix Best TV member, access the already big and always growing library of full mixing courses start to finish, mastering courses on so many different genres and a lot more. And if the videos are helping you, please consider using the new feature, the super thanks down here and support the channel. Let's get to the video. All right, these videos are aimed to the less experienced mixing engineer out there and they're gonna be straight to the point no bullshit so 12 biggest EQ mistakes number one using too narrow cues when looking for resonant frequencies which that in itself is another common mistake but we'll talk about it in the biggest mixing mistake videos this is what I mean if you have a mix and you do this a super narrow cue and you boost like 12 DB everything will resonate okay so don't do that when you look for uh, resonant frequencies don't use a narrow super narrow cue and boost 10 12 dbs okay try to have a little bit of discipline and this is how you train your ear all right boost a little maybe 5 or 6 db and don't use too narrow of a cue if a frequency is resonant or too harsh that will be enough for you to spot it otherwise everything will resonate and you will end up with a phase nightmare EQ curve like this, which will sound absolutely unnatural, okay? Number two, turn off the analyzer. Some people just rely on the analyzer too much. And as soon as they see a spike like this one, they grab it and pull it down, okay? Same for this kind of spikes here, especially if your analyzer is not calibrated. For example, even Pro-Q3 has some settings here at the bottom to calibrate the analyzer. For example, this is my settings. My range is 90, resolution is maximum, speed is minimum, and tilt is zero. I can show you that if I open another analyzer, eyes out of inside, they look pretty different, okay? And if I calibrate this differently, let's move the tilt. You see the low end? it changes dramatically. So especially if your analyzers are not calibrated and you're not sure how to calibrate them, maybe I can make a video out of it. Let me know in the comment down below if you're interested in it. Don't rely on them too much. Number three, sweeping to find the frequencies that you want either to cut or boost. And you will ask, well, David, what the hell am I supposed to do? Let me show you. Let's say you want to boost the low end on this track. Instead of sweeping and doing this, which is not a bad method, but the one that I give you will train your ears to recognize frequencies, okay? So in this case, let's say I want a deeper low end for my kick. Instead of sweeping, try to guess what the frequency is. I'm gonna say probably around 50 and 40, okay? So I'm gonna start with 50 and boost, let's say 5 dB, with a pretty narrow cue. If that doesn't give you the result that you wanted, put it back to zero and guess again. Let's try 40. All right, now I have a reference, 50 and 40, all right? 50 was a little too high, 40 is a little too low. Let's do 45. Let's open the queue a little bit. Okay, and now you should have the result that you want. Same with the high end. Actually, with the high end is, I think, more crucial to do this because the low end, you can sweep for a second and find the resonance pretty quickly, but not as easy in the mid range and the high end, especially uh, if you're soloing a cavoco or something in isolation, okay? So try to train your ears to recognize frequencies instead of searching by sweeping. Number four, using too much EQ slash trying to solve everything with EQ. There's a lot of things that can be solved with equalization, of course, but overly EQ'd material pretty often sounds unnatural. When there are many things that you can solve with other things, for example, you wanna add brightness, try saturation instead, okay? Try band selective saturation. If there's harshness, 
try a de instead, try a transient designer instead, or try a dark sounding compressor if something is too bright. And also this, we'll talk about this in the biggest compression mistake video. Understand your internal side chain of a compressor. It can help you rebalance tonally a track. So don't try to solve everything with EQ. Number five, being scared of boosting. This was kind of a strange era in the YouTube world where people magically discovered subtractive EQ. And from that point on, you were not allowed to boost anymore. People were trying to mix entire records with uh, subtracting EQ only. And if not that, you were not allowed to boost more than 3 dB. And that's complete, of course, BS, okay? You boost as much as is needed. Sure, as a general rule, if you recorded something, a vocal, a snare, a guitar, an amp, and you need 20 dB of EQ, probably the recording wasn't that great and you would have been better re-record the whole thing. But this is 2022, there's a lot of computer-based music, not everything is recorded, and there's also sound design. So don't be scared about boosting an EQ, but also keep in mind that analog EQs are not the same as digital, doesn't matter how a certain group of people scream and shout, <laughs> they're not, okay? Boosting 12 dB with my SPL is almost unnoticeable. Boosting 12 dB uh, with a digital equalizer, it is noticeable. So keep that in mind, but also don't be scared of boosting because that's why we have plus and minus, all right? Number six, only using full parametric EQs and not using classic design like KPI, Neve, and so on. Why? Let me show you why. Digital full parametric EQs like Pro Q3 and Kirchhoff EQ are amazing because you can do anything you want. You have endless possibilities, endless number of bands, endless number of filters, and endless number of combination, all right? And that's also the problem because you have too many choices and too many chances for fuck up, okay? While classic EQs, like for example, the API, they have pre-selected frequencies, okay? These are called semi-parametric EQs because they do have a wide range of frequencies, but they are somewhat limited, okay? Same for, for example, the pool tech. We have four frequencies for the low end, a little more for the top end. Same for the Neve style EQ, still pre-selected frequencies. Why? Because they work. Those frequency choices are there and they became a studio standard and classics because they usually work on pretty much everything. Now, of course, in modern music, there's again, sound design and also sometimes we need to really be super precise and we can be super precise like in mastering. And we need to zoom in on a specific note, which could be 172.5 Hertz, all right? But aside from specific tasks, usually correction, those frequencies of the classic EQs worked on so many records and they will give you a better starting point, they will give you a few choices. These things work on all the records that are out there, especially those three, okay? So you know that the problem is not the EQ, it's the material or you. Let's get to the next one. Number seven, I shouldn't even have to say this one, but I'm gonna say it anyway. And if you follow the channel for a while, this is old news, but do not high pass and low pass everything by default. Do everything with intention and know why are you doing it. Yes, most tracks in a mix will need low cut or high cut or both. How much is to be established on a track by track basis, never by default, never the same number. And some tracks maybe don't need that because at the end of the day, the rule of thumb is the less processing you do, the better your mix is gonna sound. Number eight, starting your mix with an EQ curve on your two bus. To be honest, I've never understood this one and it's not a rule. A lot of engineers use this technique successfully, but I personally do not see why you would do that. It's like starting to paint a picture and instead of having a white canvas, you have a white canvas with three blue stripes and two reds. I just don't get it. You can use two bus EQ. I use two bus EQ. I usually have a couple of EQs on my two bus. But even for me that I set my two bus processing, which is usually compression and saturation, at the beginning of the mix after gain staging, I wait until my mix is like 80 or 90% before using a Q on my two bus. And again, this is mostly preference. Every song is different and I don't understand why you would do that. You can still do it when your mix is almost done, but maybe you don't need it, okay? And again, less processing, better. Number nine, EQ in single channels before trying to EQ a bus, a group. For example, you have a drum, 12 tracks. Instead of EQing kick and snare individually first, try to put an EQ on the drum bus and see if you can get away with two or three simple moves with that EQ. 
and maybe you solve the problems. And if you can, at that point, you go to the individual channel and you fix what's wrong or what you need to enhance. The same concept with electric guitars. If you have a stack of electric guitars left and right, instead of EQing the single channels, try to EQ the guitar bus first, okay? Same with background vocals or a stack of vocals. Don't go for the first channels first when you have a group of tracks, layers of the same instrument. Number 10, not matching volume. Of course, if you boost anything, it will sound better just because it's louder, okay? This is basic. And fortunately, now we have EQs with auto gain and that's a blessing. But even if you don't use an EQ that has auto gain, please remember to level match. This goes for every processing that we do, compression, saturation, whatever that is. But with EQ, it's particularly important because you boost the top end or the low end with a smiley face EQ, everything sounds better for the first 15 minutes and then the next day, it kind of sucks. Number 11, too much top end boosting. We talked about this in several different videos, okay? Our brain perceived anything that is brighter, better. That's the first impression. Now an experienced mixing engineer knows that that's how our brain works and is able to understand when it's too much because it has a proper accurate monitoring system, because it has training, because it has experience. But if you're not an advanced mix engineer, keep that in mind. Try to go past the first excitement of boosting top end and think, okay, I know that my brain perceived this is better, but is it actually better? An advice, if you are in doubt, usually is roll off the top end, okay? And just listen to the track for like 30, 40 seconds. And then slowly re-inject the high end until it sounds pleasant and you feel like the sweet spot. Most likely it's gonna be less than when you boost it. And finally, the number 12, the most obvious yet the most important still, try not to EQ in solo. How many times this happened to you? You EQ your kick for 25 minutes and it's perfect. It's a piece of art, all right, in solo. And then you open the mix and the kick disappears. I'm pretty sure it happened to many people. This is why you don't EQ in solo as a general rule. Yes, of course, there are occasions in which you have to EQ in solo, spot a resonance, searching for the golden tone, whatever that is, okay? There is a place for EQing in solo, it's 10% okay, or 20 at the most. 80% of the time, you should EQ with your mix open. Or even if it's not the full mix is in context, like don't EQ your bass in solo without the drums, okay? Don't EQ your guitars or synths without the vocals and so on. Try not to EQ in solo because first of all, nobody will ever listen to your tracks in solo. And even if they were to, they don't care. What counts is the mix, everything in context. Also remember, one of the biggest challenges of mixing is masking. And I know you guys asked me to do a video on it a billion times. Unfortunately, it's not that easy, but I'll try to get it done. Let me know in the comment down below if you want me to expand. Masking happens when your mix is fully open or partially open, not in solo. So by EQing in solo, you're probably trying to fix a problem that wouldn't be a problem with a mix open, or you're not seeing or hearing a problem that it becomes a problem when the mix is open because some frequencies get canceled, all right? Get masked and some other ranges have build up because many instrument have energy on a specific range, okay? So don't EQ in solo. I think this is it for this video. If you guys liked it, please consider using the Super Thanks new feature down below. Let me know if you like these types of videos. Check the info box before you go. Subscribe if you haven't already. Stay safe. See you next time. Hands on my neck, hands,